name's Dr. Rob Abbott of the Manufacturing Industries Technical Service in the Water Management section. Today, I want to discuss water treatment and testing with you. Now, this tape is rather long, but we don't want you to get bored. If you feel you need a break, by all means take one, but do come back. And if you need to review it in the future, remember, just turn it on. I'll still be here. The chemical treatment of industrial water systems is an important area of our industrial sales business. The systems involved are quite costly in terms of the capital investment that your customer or prospect has made in them. Most often, they're also essential to the operation of the business itself, supplying power for machinery, heating or cooling of processes, or maintaining proper operating temperatures in some vital manufacturing equipment. These systems, therefore, must perform as efficiently as possible to prevent downtime and to maintain profitability. For all of these reasons and more, it is important that your customer sees you as a reliable and highly competent technical water treatment professional. One very simple and highly visible way you can demonstrate that professionalism is in your ability to readily perform all of the appropriate chemical tests used to determine the conditions existing in those water systems which are so central to your customer's business. The most useful tool you can have for this purpose is the WT-2000 test kit. The WT-2000 is in fact a portable water laboratory with everything needed to assess all of the important parameters for every Dubois USA water treatment product. It will replace the 1900 kit as well as the molybdate, iron, phosphate, silica, and even boiler polymer kits that you're already using to conduct your water treatment business. All of these are contained in a single, very professional case, which even includes a workbench area. This white background can also be very useful in helping you to see color changes in a rather dark maintenance area. And also, it helps keep the reagent bottles firmly seated in the case. This video is being made primarily to show you how to run each of the tests contained in this WT-2000 kit. A set of video instructions, as it were. It should be pointed out that these instructions will apply equally to those tests that are also contained in the 1900 kit. But beyond this, I'm also going to give you some important perspectives on water testing. I'm going to examine the various waters you should be looking at in those many systems you commonly treat. I'll go over why each of these waters is important and what tests should be run on each of them. And finally, I'll discuss what the results of these tests mean and how to use them to troubleshoot problems which will occasionally crop up. All of this is just to show you how very easy it can be to develop and demonstrate your professionalism to inspire that well-deserved customer confidence and increase your commission income in water treatment. So, let's begin at the beginning. Before you make a water treatment call, be certain that you're prepared and have everything you're going to need, such as the following. Of course, you'll need your WT-2000 test kit. Of course, your 1900 kit if you don't have a WT-2000 yet. You will need the proper forms to record your test results and to prepare a proposal if it's a prospect. These forms include the F2350, the Water Treatment Survey Form. One side of this is for cooling systems and the other side for boiler systems. The F2107, Water Treatment Service Report. This will be left with any customer every time you make a service call. The Cost Estimate Proposal Forms that you'll need include the F2329. This is for cooling systems which would use GCO 10 or GCO 30. The F2330 is for cooling systems using GCO 10LM 
or GCO 30 LM. The F4068 for cooling systems again, but here where super treks or on the treks would have to be used. And finally, the F2284, the confidence boiler products for boiler systems where these would apply. Always be sure that you have a good supply of quart sample mailer bottles. These bottles are free on request. And finally, your water, water management laboratory work request, F2370. This will be necessary should you have to have any work performed by the laboratory. We will be looking at a few more of these forms more closely as the video progresses. When you finally arrive at the account, whether it's a prospect or a customer, you'll have to run tests on these following water samples. First, the raw water. This is the water that's delivered to the facility as either city water or well water, usually. If this water receives no treatment on site, it may also be the makeup water. This is the water that has to be treated, so we have to know it thoroughly. Next, the softened water. This is raw water that has been passed through a water softener. Most often, this is used for boiler makeup. The tower water. This is the water that's actually circulating over the cooling tower. The boiler water. The boiler water is that which is removed directly from the boiler pressure vessel. The boiler feed water is a combination of makeup water and condensate, and it is fed into the boiler. The condensate is steam that has been used and condensed back into water. Some of it is usually returned to provide a portion of the feed water. And finally, there are chilled or hot water loops. These are what we call closed recirculating systems. However, if this is a prospect call, you're going to want to sit down with your contact and fill out the survey form before you start your testing. You want to know the size of the boilers and cooling towers, what the steam or the cooling water is being used for. Do they have any specific problems? What are they? What kind of feed and bleed equipment do they have, etc.? Just follow this form and fill in the information. You'll need it later to prepare the proposal after the testing is completed. Now, if your contact can't supply all of this information, ask to see the equipment and get what information you can off of nameplates and ID tags. Using this survey form allows you to start to keep all of your records for this account in an orderly fashion. You'll want to have records like this on file. After completing as much of the survey form as possible, ask to be shown to a point where you can get water samples and a place where you can work for a short time. Be sure to provide your contact with clean quart bottles for these samples. You want your testing to be as accurate as you can. And any other kind of a container may introduce contaminants. These bottles, as I said, are free for the asking. Be sure your contact knows you'll be back with them as shortly, as soon as you finish your testing. That is, within the hour. If this is a customer, of course, you already know where to go to do your testing. Now, there's something we want to keep in mind during all of our testing, since with most of our tests, we titrate using drops. This term, drop, seems to most people to be such a random and non-specific term. And in most of our conversational speech, it is. But that's not true in the case of the titration kit dropper bottles. Used properly and kept clean, the drop delivered by these bottles is of a very measured and reproducible size. Proper use will involve only two things. First, hold the bottle vertically. Angling the bottle can cause it to deliver a drop of a different size than you really intend and will lead to inaccurate measurements. Each drop 
should be one twentieth of a milliliter to represent, for example, ten parts per million. Any other size, it does not represent ten ppm. Second, use a steady pressure to get even, distinct drops. Squeezing the bottle hard to get done faster can deliver a smaller drop and in rapid succession with all of the inaccuracies mentioned above and in addition with the possibility you may not be able to count them fast enough. A steady stream can sometimes be delivered by the bottle. This gives you no valid information. Now, having said that, let's discuss the raw water. The raw water is the water that is delivered to the facility, probably either city water or well water. It's commonly used directly in a tower or boiler with no other form of external treatment. In this case, the undiluted raw water is the makeup water. And since this is the water you'll have to treat, you want to know it as thoroughly as you can. We'll test the raw water first. We'll start by running the following tests. We're going to check the pH. Then we'll test the P and the M alkalinities. We'll run a total hardness test chloride test. We'll be sure to do a phosphonate blank, particularly if this is a cooling tower system. This is the test that was formerly called the Monotrex test. In addition, because they're sometimes needed, we'll show you how to run an, the silica test and an iron test. Okay, now, the most common place to begin is with a simple pH test. pH test can be done either with a pH meter, if you happen to have one, or, in lieu of that, with the test strips that are provided in the kit. However, when using these strips, keep in mind that they don't always react quickly in very dilute solutions. So, you want to keep it in the water for a moment or two. Okay. Make sure you get a little agitation. After that moment or so, compare the color to the colors on the box and try to determine the pH. To me, that pH looks like it's about a 7 or so. You want to record the result that you get here either on the survey form if you're filling it out for a prospect or on the water treatment service report. This service report should be filled out completely and left with the account at the time of each service call. It's a very convenient way to keep all of your information together and it provides proof of your service call and of course of any recommendations you may have made. In reviewing your service report data and recommendations you should always be as critical of your own program as any competitor might be. With that, no competitor can come along and say you're not handling your treatment program and requirements properly. Okay? Good. Now, let's see. If the pH was 8 or higher, the next test to run would be the p-alkalinity. Now, p-alkalinity is that alkalinity which exists at a pH of 8.2 or higher. It's true that it's seldom found in raw water supplies, but it should be checked to be sure. As we'll see, it's a very important test in boiler treatment. To run this test, take a 25 mil sample of the water and add about two or three drops of reagent 638 the phenolphthalein indicator. Now if your sample remains colorless, as is the case with most raw waters, you have no p-alkalinity and your titration is complete. If, on the other hand, it turns red or pink, like this one, you don't want to titrate this with reagent 687 sulfuric acid. 
adding drop by drop, count the drops until the pink color just disappears. I only took one drop. Multiply your drops times 10 to get the parts per million of p-alkalinity as calcium carbonate. This is an industry convention used in reporting alkalinity. Now, if you're using the 1900 test kit, you have to titrate with reagent 724, the hydrochloric acid, which is in that kit. Drops times 10 still gives the same answer. Now, you want to save that colorless sample, regardless of whether you had to titrate it or not. We'll use it again for the M-alkalinity test we'll do next. Don't forget, though, record your results on the service report, or again, on the survey form. Now, the M-alkalinity, or total alkalinity, represents all alkalinity that exists above a pH of 4.3, including the p-alkalinity you've just run. It is the combined concentration of three ions, the bicarbonate, the carbonate, and the hydroxyl ions. Now, I'll take that sample that I saved and add three drops, one, two, three, of reagent 645, total alkalinity indicator. The water is a clear, bright green. Then we'll titrate with reagent 687 again, counting the drops. The endpoint is the first drop, which gives us a permanent clear red with no traces of green. Notice, if it turns red and then goes back to green, we haven't reached the end point. Here's green. There. Five drops. We'll note that it took five drops to turn red. Multiplying this times 10 gives me 50. I'll add this 50 to the p-alkalinity that I got a little bit earlier. The sum of these will give me the parts per million of m-alkalinity. For example, I had 50 here. If I had no p-alkalinity, my m-alkalinity is simply 50. If, however, I had 20 parts per million of p-alkalinity, then my M alkalinity is 50 plus 20, or 70 parts per million of M alkalinity. Okay, again, record that number on your survey form and service reports. Now, next, we'll run the total hardness test. The hardness is the calcium and the magnesium in the water. Dissolved in the water, they exist as charged ions, called cations. Combined with the alkalinity, they'll form scale when the water is heated. Here, we'll take a fresh 25 mil sample of the water and add five drops of reagent 619, the hardness buffer. Swirl that up to mix it. Then we'll add one scoop of reagent 619 or 620, excuse me, the hardness indicator. And we'll swirl that up. The sample should be a nice clear red. However, on the other hand, if it turns a clear blue like this. This sample has been softened, contains no hardness, and the test is complete. In most cases, however, it will be red. If it is, we'll titrate with reagent 683, hardness reagent, just as before, until the first drop that gives you the permanent clear blue like I had with that softened water. Take 
drops times 10 to get the PPM of total hardness as calcium carbonate, the industry standard reporting format. Record this number on the survey form or on your service report. Now these last two tests, the total hardness and the M alkalinity, are perhaps the most important tests you're going to run, at least generally speaking. You see, these are the components most commonly responsible for scale formation, and they're the components that our chemistry is designed to control. They are quite soluble in raw water at room temperature. However, they'll readily precipitate to form scale when the water is heated. In all but a few locations, it's either the hardness or the alkalinity which will determine how many cycles of concentration can be safely maintained. They'll also determine which products should be used to effectively treat the system. This we'll see later. Okay? Now, let's go on to the chloride test. This test is not important to the selection of the products, but it is the test that you're going to use to monitor those cycles of concentration. Excess cycles of concentration can result in scaling, and the chlorides will tell you if you are running too many. Chlorides are perfectly soluble. They do not precipitate. Therefore, they will perfectly reflect the degree of concentration of the water. Take a fresh 25 mil sample of water and add one drop of reagent 638, the phenolphthalein indicator, or two, <laughs> and swirl. If it turns pink or red, I would have added reagent 686, the one normal sulfuric acid, one drop at a time, until the color disappeared. If it remains colorless, I simply proceed. Next, I'll add five drops of reagent 630, the chromate indicator. Again, swirl these up. And finally, we'll titrate using reagent 706, silver nitrate, one drop at a time. Now, you may get a brief red-brown color at each addition. As long as it fades back to yellow, you've not reached the end point. The end point is the first drop to leave any hint of a permanent red-brown color. Like there. Then multiply drops times 10 to get the parts per million of chloride as chloride and record the number as before. In this case, it took four drops, 40 parts per million. Let's address a side issue here. That issue is accuracy. In most of our titrations, one drop is equivalent to 10 parts per million. That is because the relationship between the sample size we use and the size of the drop delivered by the bottle. In most every case, that level of precision is more than sufficient to monitor the system and maintain ideal conditions. On rare occasions, however, more accuracy may be needed or just desired. The chloride test is one common place where that may be the case, since accurate monitoring of cycles of concentration is needed to prevent scaling. When the chloride level of the raw water is very low, or cycles are strictly limited, Proper control is difficult. Since we can't change the drop size, the simplest solution to this problem, or to this need for greater precision, is to simply increase the sample size used for the titration. Doubling the sample size to 50 mils will sharpen your accuracy. Each drop will then be equivalent to 5 parts per million. Let's try it with this same water. Now, I'm not going to add the phenolphthalein to this sample because we've already tested and know that there's no P alkalinity. But I'll start with a 50 milliliter sample, and this time add 10 drops of the indicator. The standard instructions indicate that we should add 5 drops for each 25 milliliter sample. And again, titrating with the silver nitrate, 
will count the number of drops it takes to get a brown color. It may be fainter this time, so we'll have to watch closely. seven drops. Using this method here shows that I was a bit off before. Looks more like there was 35 ppm of chloride. Seven drops times five ppm or 35 parts per million. Now detailed discussions of both this technique and another even more precise method uh, are presented in the instructions which accompany the WT2000 kit. If you need that increased accuracy and these instructions aren't clear enough for you, call your manager or the people in Cincinnati and we'll discuss it. But let's move on. If you're dealing with a cooling tower system, you must also run a raw water blank for the phosphonate test. This test is generally only needed in cooling systems since they're the only systems which we treat with products containing phosphonate. This is the test most disliked by everyone in the field and out. It has many interferences and it can be somewhat difficult to read if you're even a bit colorblind. We have a new procedure, however, that helps to reduce uh, these interferences with the color changes. We use what we call an interference suppressor. It's reagent 0805, fluoride masking agent. Currently it has to be ordered separately because it is not presently included in either the WT-2000 or the 1900 kit. Again, starting with a 25 mil sample, add 10 drops of reagent 805, the fluoride masking agent. This is what we call the suppressor sometimes. 10. And we'll mix that up. Immediately, we can add three drops of the thiosulfate, reagent 824. Swirl that to mix, then wait 30 seconds. Now, add the reagent 802P, the XO indicator powder. We'll add two level scoops. and swirl this to completely dissolve it. The sample is not always the purple color that you're used to seeing. Sometimes it will be a peach or salmon color. Don't be alarmed about this. It's simply a little bit different sometimes with the 805. Proceed to add reagent 686, one normal sulfuric acid, one drop at a time, and you see we still get the bright yellow. Add two additional drops of the 686. At that point, we'll begin to titrate using reagent 823, one drop at a time. Add these slowly counting the drops until you get back to a pink or purple, whatever you'd like to call it. The important part here is that you will determine the end point of the test by running it the same way every time. It will always take at least one drop. Record the number as drops for future reference. Now, it is very important to run this test in the raw water. This is your reference point or background reading known as a blank. There are definitely some interferences with this test. Things that titrate like phosphonates, but they're not. Many of them, in fact, are actually unknown. Generally speaking, however, they don't seem to cycle up in the tower.
though at times it's true they can. That means now, if you find three drops of background in the raw water, and you run four cycles, you will still have only three drops of background in the tower, not the 12 that you might expect if it fully cycled up. There's a kind of a rule of thumb that you might find helpful. Generally speaking, we consider if you get four drops or less of background in the raw water, consider that it does not cycle. If you get five or more, there's an increasing chance that at least some portion of that will cycle. The new procedure, using the uh, suppressor here, reduces these problems but does not completely eliminate them. Therefore, if you still have a problem, call the home office. Ask for some help. We can often either identify the problem or at least help you to work around it. Okay, good. So, to this point, you've seen all of the essential tests needed for any raw water. However, there are two other tests which can sometimes be necessary or at least useful. Some well waters in particular may have significant levels of iron. This can later precipitate and cause deposits and other problems if not controlled. Silica is another impurity we have to consider. It's mainly a problem only in a few geographical areas, though again, some private wells may also have significant levels. And silica can set the limits on your cycles of concentration. We always have to keep this in mind. We cannot chemically clean silica scale easily. Don't let it happen to you. But we'll begin first with the iron test. The iron test is a simple comparator test. Rinse the cube with the water in question and fill it up to the line. Then add the contents of one of these foil packets. Very gently. Cap the tube and invert it several times to mix. Once it's mixed, match the color of your water to one of those on the cube and read the iron concentration. If the water is darker than the 5 ppm max on the cube, which this is, dilute it with deionized or any iron-free water and run the test again. Distilled water can be bought at the grocery store. This situation rarely occurs with raw water. Let's take a moment now to discuss making and using dilutions. In the simplest case like this, the iron test is darker than the 5 ppm max on the cube, but not really by all that much. I probably need a simple one-to-one -one dilution, one part of test water and one part of distilled water. That would make a 50% solution of the water I want to test. We can do that very easily by using any of the vials in the kit, say 25 mils of my starting water and 25 mils of distilled water. Swirl them to mix them, and then use this mix in the iron cube. And if I look at it, I think the result I get now looks to be between the 3 ppm and 4 ppm standards. We'll call it about three and a half. But this sample is only half strength with respect to the original water. So I actually have twice as much, or 7 ppm. Let's go over how that works. In this case, I had taken one part of system water and one part of distilled water to make my solution. So I had a dilution factor of 2. 
I took my reading on the diluted sample of 3.5, multiplied it times the dilution factor of 2, and found that indeed I have 7 ppm as a true answer. What would have happened if I had, uh, if the sample had been much darker than the cube? The only difference I would have had would have been in the dilution factor. Let's say I had one part of system water, but I thought that I would need three parts of distilled water. There. In that case, my dilution factor would have been four. I would have had three and a half ppm as the reading. We saw that on the cube. I would have multiplied that times my dilution factor and found that I had 14 ppm. This same procedure is followed for any dilution that you should need to make. So let's move on. I said that the silicate test is also sometimes necessary. It's a very simple test using a color comparator. Very reliable and believe me, much faster than sending a sample into the laboratory. Here's everything in the test. Take the tube and fill it to the line that's marked on it. Now, because this tube is so thin, I like to place it in my comparator for stability, just to hold it while I'm working with the reagents. First, add seven drops of silica reagent number one to the tube. Seven. Put that out of the way. And you want to cap that tube and invert it at least four times to mix it. Here, I'll put it back in. Next, add six drops of silica reagent number two. My cap on. Again, invert at least four times to mix it. Then wait five minutes. After that five minutes, add six drops of silica reagent number three. Again, cap the sample and invert to mix. And place it stable and wait two minutes more. Finally, using the little brown tip dropper in the kit, add two drops of reducing reagent. It's very thick. Two drops there. This one's a little thicker. Again, cap, invert to mix well. And as you see, the tube will turn blue if there is any silica present. Finally, here, we'll put the tube into the comparator. And here, using the light background, let me, I'll turn mine this way to read it, to read the silica concentration. Check both sides if necessary. I don't think so. By the way, you'll notice that I'm using two white boards during this video. 
Don't look for two. You've only got one in your kit. This just makes things much easier to demonstrate to you. As we, I look at this, I'd say the color is between the 4 ppm and 6 ppm standards. I'd call that about 5 ppm of silica. Now, of course, as we said with the iron test, if this test had been off scale, I would have simply done a dilution, done the test again, and remember to multiply that result by the dilution factor. And of course, I'll record my uh, final result on both sheets as before. Those are all the tests that should concern you when dealing with a raw water sample. Now, if you have a WT-2000 or even just a 1900 kit in front of you, and you may want to go try and do some of these tests, why just go on out to your kitchen sink, get a sample of your own home water, and go to it. If you need help, remember, rewind the tape to the test that you need help with and watch it again. Now, if you only have a 1900 kit, you can do every test except the iron and the silica. When you're finished with your testing, we'll continue. But now, stop the tape, go to work. We're back. Don't you feel better about running these water tests now? They really aren't that difficult. With a little more practice, you'll be doing them like a pro. So, now that we've finished testing the raw water, let's move on to some of the other water samples that we said you'll have to test and the additional tests you have to run on some of them. First, we'll continue with the soft water. This they might be using as makeup in the boiler. The soft water should be checked for the following. First, the total hardness. Second, the M alkalinity. And finally, chlorides. Is the water soft? In other words, is the softener working? Remember, if the sample is still pink, or even purple, rather than perfectly blue like this, the softener is not working perfectly and it needs to be checked. But just what should be checked? Here are several things. The time since the last regeneration. Has it been too long since they regenerated and the resin is exhausted? The salt level in the brine tank. Very simply, have they run out of salt? And an open bypass valve. Has somebody opened up a bypass valve and water is not going through the softener? Correcting one of these problems will usually bring the hardness into line. If the softener is working properly, the M alkalinity and the chlorides should be essentially the same as the raw water. The softener only removes hardness. It does nothing else. So enough of the soft water. Let's move on now to the test that should be run on the tower water sample. Run the following tests. The total hardness, the chlorides, the M alkalinity, and here the phosphonate, or the molybdenum, if a molybdate program is being used. You can also run silica, iron, or P alkalinity if you suspect a specific problem that would require them. You've already seen how to run each of these tests except for the molybdenum, and we'll discuss that one shortly. Now, if this is a prospect call, the phosphonate test may not tell you much. After all, you don't know the competitive product factors. However, you will definitely need to run it on those systems using Dubois Tower products that specify the phosphonate test for control. Those would be GCO10, Omnitrex, Supertrex, GCO30, and, of course, High Cycle 125. This is where you'll use that phosphonate blank you ran on the raw water. After you've completed the phosphonate titration on the tower water, use the following equations. First, take the tower water drops minus the raw water drops 
to get a difference. Remember, your raw water phosphonate results were recorded as drops. Now you know why. Next, take that difference, multiply it times the product factor to determine the parts per million of product in the system. The product factor is on each of the product data sheets. You probably already know that the factor for GCO10 is 25. So let's take a look at an example. Let's say that the tower drops were 15 and the raw water drops were 3. When I subtract 3 from 15, I get a difference of 12 drops. That difference of 12 times the product factor for GCO10, which is 25, indicates that I have 300 parts per million of GCO10 in the system. Exactly right. Two other chemicals now used in some cooling tower treatment products are molybdenum and phosphate. Therefore, you may find yourself having to test for these too. Dubois, of course, uses molybdenum as a corrosion inhibitor in GCO 10 LM, GCO 30 LM, high cycle 147, and high cycle 127, which are designed for makeup waters with M alkalinities of 30 ppm or less. Molybdenum is also used in both OmniGuard and Theroguard closed loop treatments. Let's take a look at the molybdenum test first. The first step in the Molly test is to make your indicator solution. Start by putting five scoops of reagent 900, the molybdate indicator powder, into the small vial. Into that vial then, add two and a half mils of the indicator solvent, reagent 901, using a large calibrated dropper. And swirl that around to dissolve the powder. Don't worry that all of these crystals do not dissolve. They're not supposed to. The larger crystals are simply a carrier and have nothing to do with the indicator powder coating the crystals. Now, having made that, we'll take a 25 milliliter sample of makeup water and a 25 milliliter sample of system water in two different vials. Using one of the small one mil calibrated droppers. To each sample, I'm going to add one milliliter of reagent 890 molybdenum buffer solution. I'll swirl those up to mix them. And with another pipette, one milliliter of the indicator solution that you made. We try not to get any of the crystals, but don't worry if you get a couple. You won't hurt anything. We'll swirl these up. Note that the system water is a rather distinctive red, while the makeup water is only a bit discolored. This lack of coloration indicates that there is no molybdenum in the makeup water. There's plenty in the system, though. Finally, we're going to titrate the system water with reagent 892, the molybdenum titrating solution, drop by drop, until the color matches that of the blank, at least if you can. Let's be honest, though. The tower water may have picked up various airborne contaminants. Therefore, you may not be able to perfectly match those colors. If you do have trouble making the colors match, try this approach. 
watch closely and count the drops very carefully watching the color change. Each drop that you add should cause the color to change at least a bit, especially near the end. There. That drop, it changed. There. Again, I don't know how it showed on camera, but there was another change, but not much. Seven... That last drop, number seven, the color did not change. Because six drops brought about a change, but drop seven did not change, that means that I have only six drops worth of molybdenum in the system. In this case, you can see how closely this matches the raw water. Now, with a 25 mil sample, calculate drops times two to equal the molybdenum concentration. In this case, 6 times 2 equals 12. The normal product concentration will show 10 to 12 ppm of moly in the system. So I'm right on target. One caution I would mention, however. The molybdenum must be freely circulating in the water to be effective. If the water has some kind of a rusty tinge to it, or if it contains visibly circulating rust particles, the molly may bind to that rust. You will test it as present, but it's not free in the water and not effective. In that case, try testing a filtered sample. You may not find any there at all. One more thing and I'll move on. If you're using molly in a cooling tower, do not try to run the phosphonate test. For one thing, the molly interferes quite strongly. For another, why would you want to run a test known to have interferences when you already know the results of the Molly test that doesn't? Okay, fine. Now, as I was saying, you can also check for the presence of a phosphate program with your WT2000 kit. The phosphate cube is used just like the iron cube was. We take a sample of water, into the cube up to the line and pour in the contents of one of the small phosphate pillows. Get it all in there. Then cap the cube. Invert it several times to mix it up. This, sometimes this powder is a little bit difficult to dissolve. You just have to get a good proportion of it in. And then wait from one to two minutes for a blue color to develop. Remember now, a blue color indicates the presence of phosphate, which you can quantitate by comparing to the color standards on the cube. This one's getting pretty high. If the phosphate concentration is higher than the 5 ppm max on the cube, what are we going to do? We're going to run a dilution the same way we did for the iron cube. Now, let's move on to the boiler system and test the actual boiler water. For the boiler water sample, let the operator help you if this is a prospect call. After all, he's the man who's most familiar with the best location to take it. What you really want to do, though, do is to make sure that regardless of the point from which he takes that sample, be it the sight glass, bottom blowdown valve, or some other sight, you want the line to be well flushed. Now, I'm going to also show you another little trick. When you get your boiler water sample, take part of it, put it into a smaller container, such as a small oiler mailer. Fill it as much as possible, put the lid on tightly, Drop it into a quart mailer filled with cold water. This is going to be your own little sample cooler. And the sample will be used to run the sulfide test. I'll explain why in a bit. Cap the rest of the sample also. Let it cool down. 
These tests are much easier to run if the sample is cooled below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, you can even run this closed jar under cool water, if at all possible, to help cool it in a more reasonable time. An actual sample cooler like this is really a small heat exchanger. It can be put on a boiler to cool the sample as it is taken. It's a very good idea, and you can provide them with one. To begin with, take a look at the sample. What color is it? It should be nearly colorless, maybe just a bit of an off color. We sometimes call that straw. Anything else could be a sign of trouble. Open up the bottle. How clear is the water? Again, it should be pretty clear, although it can be a bit hazy or cloudy if you're using some high hardness makeup water. You can check the sediment level. I see none here. That's good. Now, the tests you want to run on the boiler water are these. First, the pH. Then, the P and M alkalinities. The chlorides. The sulfite. And the boiler polymer. In addition, if this is a competitive situation and you suspect a phosphate program is being used, why the phosphate test would be, then be appropriate. We've seen how to run all of these tests except for the sulfite and the boiler polymer. We'll demonstrate those in a, just a few minutes. The boiler water pH normally falls within the range of 10 and a half to 12. P alkalinity, we stipulate, should be maintained between 300 and 500 parts per million. And the M alkalinity should not exceed 800 parts per million. In addition, the OH alkalinity should normally be maintained between 100 and 300 ppm to precipitate the magnesium hardness and also to prevent silica deposition. The OH alkalinity will be calculated using this following equation. 2P minus M equals OH. That means that 2 times the P alkalinity minus the M alkalinity will give you the OH alkalinity. For example, if I had a P alkalinity of, let's say, 450, I would take 2 times that 450, subtract an M alkalinity of, let's say, 700. That's 2 times the P then is 900 minus 700 to indicate I have 200 ppm oops, of OH alkalinity. Don't bother to check the hardness in the boiler water. It does not cycle and so it tells you very little. In fact, it can even be a little confusing. In the case of a soft water program, however, it's not bad to occasionally check it to get uh, some evidence for yourself that the softeners are or are not working consistently. The chlorides now will tell you the number of cycles that are being run, just as we discussed with the cooling tower water. Divide boiler chlorides by the raw water chlorides to get the cycles. You already know how many they can run with the raw water supply that you tested earlier. Are they running too many cycles, risking scale formation or carryover? Are they running too few cycles and running uneconomically? These are the kinds of questions that the chlorides can answer for you. And you should be asking them about your own program as well as a competitor's program. I guarantee your competitor will be asking those questions. Now, we've listed two additional tests, new ones, that you'll need to run on the boiler water. The sulfites and the boiler polymer. The sulfites must be run by you on site. Accurate results cannot be obtained by the time a sample is sent to and arrives at the lab. Now this is where you use that sample to put in the small bottle and then in the homemade sample cooler. 
The reason being the sulfite reacts very quickly with oxygen, and it reacts even more quickly when it's hot. So we put it into the small bottle and capped it tightly to exclude any air, and again, even capped the large bottle. I've already poured my water out of here, just sort of shake that sample out. It's nice and cool now, so we can work with it. What I want to do is just gently, gently pour a 25 mil sample, and don't shake it any more than you have to. First, add two or three drops of reagent 638, the phenolphthalein, indicating the presence of the p-alkalinity. Now, add reagent 725, the acid starch indicator. Start with one dipper to see if the red color will clear. If you need more to clear the red, use it. In this case, mine cleared. After the color is gone, add two additional dippers of the acid starch indicator. And swirl those to dissolve them a bit. Try not to swirl too heartily. Finally, we'll titrate with reagent 699, the iodide iodate indicator, to a stable blue. See, that blue fades each time. There. That blue is not going to fade. We control our programs to a sulfite level of between 30 and 50 ppm to ensure that all oxygen has been scavenged therefore protect against rust and pitting. An excess now is not detrimental unless it's another indication of an overtreatment. However, much less than 30 ppm, and there could be a danger of pitting. Now, one final test that should be run on a boiler, regardless of whether it's a phosphate or a carbonate treatment program, is the boiler polymer test. Regardless of the chemistry in use, any precipitates which are formed must be conditioned by polymers to limit crystal growth and to maintain their fluidity and prevent adherence to the tubes. That is what forces the formation of bottom sludge and inhibits scale formation. Fluid precipitates in the bottom of the boiler are sludge. When precipitates deposit on the tubes, they are scale. So, if the water is hazy or cloudy, the first step will be to filter 50 mils of cooled boiler water using the syringe filter assembly that I have here. Place a filter paper on top of the screen. Filter paper is in this little jar here. Then, place the O-ring on top of the filter paper. Next, simply screw it back on, or screw it on nice and tight. There's the filter assembly. Now, we'll filter our 50 mil sample using the syringe in the kit. Remember, if this is your own confidence program, the sample must be a one-to-one -one mixture of boiler water and distilled or DI water. With any other program, it should be a straight boiler water. Simply press the sample through the filter. Now, to get 50 milliliters is going to require that you refill the syringe a couple of times since it's only a 20 mil syringe. When you do this, be sure to remove the filter holder each time. Otherwise, you will ruin the filter inside by pulling it backwards, and you'll have to start all over again. To the filtered sample, add two scoops 
of reagent B. Cap it up and shake this one well to dissolve it. It doesn't always dissolve right away. Be patient. Uh, it will dissolve. Next, add two scoops, a little more swirl there, two scoops of reagent A. But after this one now, you do not want to shake it. This one, we're just going to swirl gently to get it into solution. Notice it's turning cloudy already. Now, we'll wait about five minutes, plus or minus 30 seconds. And in this case, the time is important. Now, take this special vial that has the two blue lines on it and the X in the bottom. And begin to fill it with this now hazy or cloudy boiler water solution. You want to add only enough. Oh, wait a minute. Let's get some in here. You want to add only enough to just blot out the X in the bottom of the vial. Rotate the vial a little if you need to to see that you really can no longer distinguish that X. the water level by looking at the two lines on the side of the vial. You want the level to lie between the two blue bands. If the level is within or below the lower band, the polymer level is a bit high. If it is within or above the upper band, there's not enough polymer to really ensure good sludge dispersion and treatment level should be increased. The next water sample you have to check is the condensate. Now this is the steam that is turned back into water after performing some kind of work. Unfortunately, it's frequently the most difficult sample to obtain because so many systems are designed without sampling points. However, Every effort should be made to get a sample. Although in a properly operating boiler, the condensate should be almost distilled water, it can be very corrosive. This corrosivity is caused by the carbon dioxide, which is produced by chemical reactions in the boiler, traveling out with the steam. <clears throat> when the condensate forms, the CO2 produces carbonic acid, which can be very corrosive to the return lines. We try to control this corrosion by using a means which also travel with the steam and neutralize the carbonic acid. Therefore, we have to be sure that the amines are doing their job by testing the condensate pH before it becomes part of the feed water. Have the boiler operator help you get the required sample before it gets back to the makeup or condensate return tank. Now, since pH meters and pH strips aren't very accurate in very pure water, the best way to check the pH of condensate is with reagent 638, the phenolphthalein indicator. Put about two to three drops into a 25 mil sample of cooled condensate and note the color. If you get no color, such as in this sample, you need more condensate treatment. 
A faint to medium pink is just about right. Remember, the 638 changes color at about a pH of 8.2. And finally, a strong, intense color says that your pH is too high. It may be a sign that you have some process contamination or that you have boiler water carryover. In this case, you'll want to go ahead and run a chloride test as well. If the chloride is greater than 10 ppm, chances are that you have carryover. And the higher the chloride level, the more carryover you may be experiencing. At this point, I think it's best to discuss the situation with your account and try to determine the cause. Now, this is a very good place also to talk about a conductivity meter. Neither the WT2000 nor the 1900 test kits contain a conductivity meter. But if you plan to sell a lot of water treatment, you should probably obtain one like this, which can also be used, of course, as a pH meter. I bring this up here because conductivity is a good way to check the purity of condensate. Good condensate should have a reading of less than 50 micromoles on the meter, and many times it'll be less than 25 micromoles. Any contamination from a process or carryover can give you a reading in the hundreds and should be checked out immediately with the account. You'll also find the conductivity meter useful for setting up boiler and cooling tower automatic blowdown controllers, which are based on conductivity. It can also be used when checking for leaks in nitrite-treated uh, closed systems, which we'll discuss in a moment. Now, we're going to check the feed water. This is the water that is fed directly to the boiler. It's found in the deaerator, if there is one, or maybe in the condensate receiver. Just maybe, what they might call a feed water tank. No matter where you find it, it will be a mixed water, consisting of some proportion of makeup water and some proportion of condensate, depending on how much is being returned. The feed water may also contain the treatment chemicals. We'll run these tests. The total hardness and the chloride. The chlorides will help us to estimate the amount of condensate being returned. Since this tank contains some proportion of condensate, which is essentially distilled water with little or no chloride, the feed water chloride level should be lower than the makeup. By the way, if it's higher, then you should tell the engineer that there is either surging and carryover from the boiler, or the softener may have malfunctioned or just possibly he may have a process leak which contains chlorides. As I said, let's take a look at how we use the condensate chloride, the feed water chlorides, and the makeup water chlorides to determine the percent condensate return. We'll do it using this equation. First, take the feed water chlorides and subtract the condensate chloride. Divide that by the makeup chlorides minus the condensate chlorides. Multiply the answer you get here by 100 to get the percent makeup. The remainder of the water in the tank will be condensate. Now let's consider the case that in a properly operating boiler condensate chlorides should be zero. In this case the equation simply becomes the feed water chlorides divided by the makeup water chlorides times 100 is the percent makeup. And of it follows from that that 100% minus the percent makeup will be the condensate return. So if you have a 30% makeup, 100 minus 30 shows that you have 70% condensate return. Next, let's test the closed loop samples. Now, in some plants, there may be a closed chilled loop or a closed hot water loop. In others, there may be both. The thing to remember is that molybdenum and nitrite are the two most common inhibitors used in these closed systems. Nitrite is the preferred inhibitor for temperatures over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of our competitors are using molybdates at higher temperature, but they're using them at concentrations exceeding 100 parts per million. 
Dubois closed loop Molly products, the Omnigard and Thuragard, are targeted for 10 to 12 ppm of Molly and should not be used above 120 degrees Fahrenheit. If you have a molybdenum program, run the Molly test the same as you did for the tower water. However, be doubly sure that you do not have a lot of suspended iron oxide, or you could end up with insufficient free Molly for good corrosion protection. If the inhibitor, however, is nitrite from a competitor, or if you're using our products, Isogard or Isogard Plus, then you'll have to want run the nitrite test. It's the one test where the standard sample volume is only 5 milliliters rather than 25. If it's hot, uh, you can cool it first in a sealed container, like a small oil mailer, the same as we did with the steam boiler water sample. The nitrite, just as the sulfite, oxidizes more quickly when it's hot. Fill the special small vial to the 5 mil mark with the system water. Add 4 drops of reagent 819, ferroin indicator, and mix those in. The sample you see is a rather dark red. Now, titrate fairly quickly with reagent 820 can solution using only a little agitation and count carefully. The first drop that makes the solution turn a permanent light blue is the end point. And toward the end you'll see I'm slowing down to make certain I don't overshoot. And it no. times 40 equals the ppm of nitrite. The proper concentration for Isogard and Isogard Plus is 1,000 to 1,200 parts per million. So you're shooting for at least 25 to 30 drops. If the concentration of nitrite continually drops over time, you probably have one of three things happening. First, water leaks. The system may be leaking and taking on untreated makeup water. Check the color of the water. The dye should also be fading in this case. And the conductivity, dropping from a normal Isogard system reading of 3 to 4,000. A water meter on the makeup line may help also. Second, air leaks or exposure. This system may not really be closed. You may be getting air into the system, which will oxidize the nitrite to nitrate. Look for open tanks and have them covered. Possibly a circulating pump may have a failing seal and be sucking air. This would have to be discussed with your account. Both of these are simple air intrusion problems, but from different sources. One indication of this problem is that the nitrite drops but the conductivity remains about the same, as does the color. Third, for biological reasons, you may have a bacterial problem. Here, the nitrite level drops, but the conductivity remains high. The pH may also drop in this case. A regular addition of GAX26 can help prevent this. If you suspect a bacterial problem, Call the lab for special handling instructions needed for the laboratory to get valid bacterial counts on your samples. You can also help yourself by ordering and using some microprobe kits to monitor the bacterial levels in the system. All in all, I think you can see just how easy all of the tests found in this WT2000 test kit are to run. I hope I've also been able to give you some help in learning how to interpret the results you get in your testing. With a bit of practice and experience, 
you can expect to prove to any prospective customer that you're a real professional who understands his systems, who cares about them and their proper functioning, and will take the best possible care of them. Right about now, though, you're probably saying to yourself, sure, sounds good, but what if I do all this and it still makes no sense to me? It's certainly true that not all questions can be answered easily or at all with only the resources available in the field. The purpose of this training material is to show you exactly what you really can do on site and how to use it to your best advantage. Sometimes it's only a matter of interpreting or translating the data you already have on hand from your own testing and not the fact that you need more or better tests run. The best of information can sometimes be confusing. That's the time to get together as much of the information as you can and call your manager or the specialist at the home office. Just make sure that you've run all of the tests suggested before you call. Then you won't have to go back and get missing data when there are questions asked. It's very probable that we can help you interpret your data and diagnose the problem right on the phone. The whole idea then is to do everything you can in the field and maybe we can solve the problem quickly. Laboratory testing is of course always available to you and your customer as a normal part of the best service anyone can give. But it takes time that you may not have or may not need to lose. Receipt of a sample mailed to the lab can take up to nine days. Therefore, by the time the analysis is completed in one to four days, it could be anywhere from four to 13 days before you can even be VMB'd an answer. And then even longer if you need a written response. So you can see it is definitely to your advantage to do as much testing as possible in the field, particularly when time is critical. Whenever there's any doubt about a specific problem or if any additional information is needed, don't hesitate to request that samples be laboratory tested. When this occurs, however, please do everything in your power to obtain all of the samples and information that we request. Refer to your service manual or earlier parts of this video for details of the samples you need for each system. Remember, a full diagnosis requires a full system's worth of samples and information. To request laboratory analyses, you'll definitely need to have a laboratory work request form in your arsenal of tools. Form F-2370 is free for the asking and required to be completely filled out. We accept no substitutes. Complete analysis, please, does not describe a problem and will not be accepted. Let's take a closer look at this form. Let's begin with the front side of the work request form. First, your name and recap are required. And we also want to put the account name and address on the work order, the city and state. Include the type of business or installation that you're dealing with. We need to understand the various operations you treat and understand the problems that are particular to each. It's a lot faster if we know. What is the present treatment being used in the systems for which you're submitting the samples? If the products are competitive materials, find out as much as you can. An MSDS and Tech Data Sheet would sure be a great help. Follow the instructions provided regarding sample sizes, suggested sampling points, and techniques, etc. Label the bottles and list them. Please use the same identification on both the work order and the bottles. Next, characterize the heating or cooling systems and the uses to which each is being put. Finally, keep in mind that 
analytical results themselves are always typewritten, computer generated. But what kind of a response might you need to the questions that you've posed? Do you need the results only? This is the fastest. Perhaps handwritten recommendations to help you with your thinking will be good for you. Or do you really need a typewritten letter containing recommendations for presentation to the customer? But let's take a look at the back side of the form also. Here, we'll see first a listing or menu of all of the standard tests that will be done on each type of sample that you might send. But really, we're interested in this area here. There is a space provided here to include the titration results that you got in the field. Fill these in. Write your own columns if need be. Who knows, your problem may be as simple as a bad reagent or misunderstanding a titration procedure. But don't write down an average result from this location or what you got last time. Write down the results you get with the samples you're sending in. Finally, a complete description of your problem. What you really need here is a justification of why the laboratory is being asked to spend some significant monies to test each of the samples you sent rather than doing them in the field yourself. After all, you have a WT2000. It is much more expensive and time consuming to send them to the lab. Let's be clear about this though. The laboratory is not looking to refuse properly submitted and necessary samples. We simply want to discourage the needless consumption of time and expense for both you and the home office personnel. At this point, we've gone over all of the tests in the WT2000 test kit and shown you how to run them. We've also discussed what they mean and how you can use these tests to service a water treatment account. But what if this is a prospect and not a customer? We didn't do all that testing just to be a good guy, no. You want to sell this prospect a Diversity Dubois water treatment program. In order to do that, you're going to have to prepare a proposal. This prospect will want to know what product or products he's to use and how much it's going to cost him to use them. Now that you have all of your waters tested, you can do that right on the spot by using the cost estimate and proposal forms we told you about way back at the beginning. Remember, we said to be sure to bring them with you on your service call. Let's start with a cooling tower proposal. But before we do, we'll make a few assumptions. First of all, assume that our raw water analysis gave the following results. Total hardness of 170 ppm, an M alkalinity of 110 ppm, silica of 8, and a chloride of 35 ppm. The second assumption will be that this is a 200 ton tower and that it's operating at only a 40% load because it was sized in anticipation of plant expansion. We'll also assume that neither the water nor any part of the system gets hotter than 120 degrees Fahrenheit. If the temperatures are higher than 120, refer to your cooling treatment decision tree, this is form S4710, to help make a different product choice. Okay, now since our raw water has an M alkalinity greater than 30, and the tower is less than 400 tons, this would appear to be a natural for GCO10. So, we take out form 2329. This is the cost estimate and proposal form for GCO 10. Start right out by turning to section 1. Here, we simply have to fill in the cooling tower size, 200 tons. Note that if we ask this up front, we don't have to calculate it using this equation. 
Next, move to section two. Here, we fill in the answers in our makeup uh, water analysis. Total hardness, 170. An M alkalinity of 110. A silica of 8. And a chloride of 35 ppm. You can also fill in the conductance if you have indeed purchased a meter, as we suggested. Next, we'll move on to section 3. Here, we calculate the maximum allowable cycles of concentration. Simply locate the area where the M alkalinity of 110 and a hardness of 170 intersect. This tells us we can run a maximum of four cycles in this tower. Next, we'll move on down to section four. Here, we approximate the product dosage per 1,000 gallons. Note that at four cycles, GCO10 should be fed at a rate of 0.57 pints per 1,000 gallons. You can work in pounds also if you're more comfortable with them. A use cost then can be calculated very simply. 0.57 pints per 1,000 gallons of makeup multiplied times the current cost of GCO10, which is $2.65 per pint, equals $1.51 per 1,000 gallons of makeup. Maybe that's exactly what this customer would like to see. Or it could be that he'd rather see that as an annual cost estimate. That we can do in section 5. We know that the tower capacity of 200 tons multiplied times the operating load of 40 percent gives us an 80 developed tons of refrigeration. That 80 tons divided by 100 times 5,760 gallons per day, got that here in section 5A. Four, at four cycles, a 100 ton tower should use about 5,760 gallons of makeup a day. Recapping, 80 over 100 times that 5,760 gallons a day gives us an average makeup of 4,608 gallons per day. Let me call that 40, about 4,600. The next section, C, average makeup of 4,600 divided by 1,000 times a dollar and 51 cents per 1,000 gallons of makeup, which we calculated up above, gives us a daily cost of $6.95. All we have to do now is ask how many days per year they operate, let's say 260, and that times the $6.95 per day shows us that it would cost this prospect $1,807 per year. Now since you've tested his tower water, you should be able to tell this prospect some important factors. Maybe you can run more cycles with GCO10 for savings in chemical and water consumptions. Or maybe he's running too many cycles and in danger of scaling his heat exchangers. In order to determine this, divide the tower water values of chloride, hardness, and M alkalinity by the makeup water values of the same components. This will give you the cycles of concentration ratio for each component. And this is an important point. Now, if everything is running well, then hardness and M alkalinity will cycle to approximately the same level as the chlorides. So if you see four cycles by chlorides, then you'd better see pretty close to four cycles of alkalinity and hardness. If they show significantly less cycling than the chlorides, chances are the system is developing scale someplace. In that case, you may be able to sell a cleanup program as well as the regular treatment. 
Well, now that the tower proposal is complete, let's move on to a boiler proposal for this same prospect. Reach into your briefcase, pull out a copy of Form F-2284. This is the Confidence Selection Guide and Cost Estimate Form. And again, before we do this, we'll make a couple of assumptions. First, this is a 200 horsepower boiler operating at 100 PSI using the same makeup water as the cooling tower. Also, that there are no condensate treatment restrictions. Begin in section one by filling in the same raw water analysis that we used for the tower. The total hardness is 170, the M alkalinity is 110, and the silica is 8 ppm. Section two helps us select the product to use. Which of these three statements holds true? In this case, we have a non-softened makeup water, the hardness is greater than the M alkalinity, and we know that we can use condensate line treatment. Therefore, we would select confidence 10C. Move down to section three, this will help us to determine the allowable number of cycles of concentration. A hardness of 170 says we should keep it to about five cycles. A silica of eight says that we can run 15. Regardless of what the silica says, we are restricted to around five or six cycles by the hardness. The lowest number of cycles must always be used as the limiting factor. Moving on to section four, this will help us to determine the dosage rate for confidence 10C. We subtract the alkalinity from the hardness. Here we find out how much permanent hardness we have to deal with. 170 minus 110 is 60. We find that column and our allowable number of cycles from step three there, find where those intersect to find that it will require 3.75 pints of confidence 10C to treat each 1,000 gallons of the hard makeup water. We'll move down to section 5A next and simply do some simple arithmetic. 3.75 pints per 1,000 gallons of makeup times the $1.95 per pound cost of confidence 10C, at least currently, multiplied times the 1.23 product factor shows us that it's $8.99 per 1,000 gallons of makeup. The product factor in this equation allows for the fact that a pint of product weighs more than one pound. If your contact is able to tell you exactly how much water he uses, you could move down to section 5B and cost that out for the year. After you've finished with all of your calculations, you can then move on to fill out a more formal proposal for this customer, also contained in the cost estimate guide. On this proposal, you have a place to fill in any equipment that you think might help the system run more efficiently. Now, in the case of both of these proposals, be sure to point out that your cost per 1,000 gallons of makeup is quite accurate as long as the cycles are maintained as recommended. However, be equally clear that the annual cost is only an estimate. This estimate can be thrown off by many factors, including these. First, the plant load and the capacities may change. The weather conditions, these can vary quite widely and have a significant impact on both heating and cooling needs. The number of shifts and hours and even the number of days worked can significantly affect the need for heating and cooling. And finally, variation in the condensate return factor as far as the boilers are concerned. None of these factors can be accurately predicted, nor will they remain constant over an entire year. 
And remember again, since you've already run tests on the boiler water, the feed water, and the condensate, you can tell the prospect something about how his system is being run at present, just as we did for the tower. Is the boiler being run at too many cycles or too few cycles? Does it have enough sulfite for the proper oxygen protection? Is the condensate pH high enough to prevent grooving? Is the condensate contaminated? How much condensate return does the system have? All of these can be great points for selling your proposal. Hello, I'm Raleigh Kellogg. I just want to step in here for a moment to wrap up this training. However, before we close, I'd like to review some of the things that we hope you've learned from this video. First of all, we hope that you have learned which water samples to test at your water treatment accounts. Second, which tests to run on each of the various samples. And then, of course, how to run every test in the WT2000 kit. Along with that, you have learned to interpret the test results so that you can maintain good customer service and prevent problems. You've also learned how to get the proper tech service assistance uh, if it is needed. And last but not least, you have learned to prepare on-site cooling water and boiler water treatment proposals for your prospects. All of these things are designed to make you a more competent and professional water treatment sales rep. I hope we have accomplished our goal because I believe that Dr. Rob Abbott has done an excellent job of presenting the WT2000 test procedures and how those test results can be used to sell more water treatment. If you understand and use what he presented here, it will go a long way to assuring your success in water treatment. I'm sure you will sell more water treatment and also keep and maintain more of what you sell. Service is the key. Come back and watch the whole film or just watch specific sections if you feel you might get a little help solving a specific problem. After all, if it helps you to expand and maintain your own and Diversity Dubois USA's water treatment business and profits, we all benefit. The best of luck to all of you.